Welcome everyone to uh, this Friday's uh, seminar. Sorry, give me the microphone. Uh, uh, okay, uh, and before I introduce our speaker for today, I just mention uh, some of the other events we've got coming up on, on this, uh, particularly on these Fridays. A great lineup for the rest of this term. So, for those of you who enjoyed the Amazon Indigenous event on Tuesday, there's a another treat uh, next. Uh, Wednesday, uh, uh, the 1st of November, where we have a screening of a new documentary, We Are Guardians, which is about how indigenous uh, people are protecting the Amazon rainforest. It's been winning a lot of prizes at film festivals around the country, and it's being shown here with, along with the producers and directors, and we have a little Q&A with the producers and directors of the film after that. And that's this coming Wednesday at five o'clock in this lecture theatre. And then in terms of Friday seminars, just quickly run through the ones we've got for the rest of this term. Next week, we've got Dustin Benton from the Green Alliance on can we have it all from the land, looking at how do we uh, trade off between food and nature recovery and other targets for the, for the UK lands uh, 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 in our planning. Uh, the week after, we've got Christina Hicks from Lancaster University on fishing for nutrition, health, healthy oceans for people and planet. Uh, the week after, we have Sophie Montserrat from Rewilding Europe about rewilding European landscapes. Uh, and the, fourth, the week after, James Bullock from the Center for Ecology and Hydrology about on rewilding restoration and the future of nature recovery. And we end the term with Laura, Laura martinez Suez from Q on mycorrhizae and ecosystem functioning. So quite a, a nice range of talks that do come along. And if you're not on our mailing list, just Google Oxford University Biodiversity Network and you'll you'll see it, you can get onto that, onto that mailing list. So over to today's speaker, Earl Ellis. Uh, some of you will have seen him speak, but others may not have a few weeks ago. He's professor of uh, geography and environmental systems at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. Uh, and he uh, has, has, has a range of things behind him. He's been part of the Anthropocene Working Group. Uh, 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 he's been involved in a lot of discussions about framing our, our relationship with the planet uh, uh, and the Anthropocene and, 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 and similar concepts. Uh, but also he is that the anthromes dude, uh, as he likes to introduce himself. Uh, so the, the concept of anthromes, this human modified biomes, uh, was something that Earl originated and has, uh, has uh, promulgated in, in various forms as a way of thinking about uh, our relationships with the biosphere and how they've, uh, how they've changed over time. I'm sure we'll, we'll touch on that in part, part of his talk. So, and he's here on sabbatical on and off for, for this entire year. So do, do feel, I encourage you to interact with him uh, reach out to him as well. Uh, he's, he's always open for a coffee and a conversation. So over to you, Earl. All right. Thank you, Yadvinder, for uh, for hosting me and also Leverhulme Center, of course, for uh, hosting this and the, the meeting. Uh, how many of you saw the rainbow today? Raise your hand if you saw the rainbow. I saw a lot of people like not noticing the rainbow, and I thought, wow, it's, I, I've been here for two months. It's the only rainbow I've seen. Uh, so it's a beautiful day. Anyway. Uh, so let's get started. I want to talk about three things today. Uh, the first is obviously in the title, right? The idea that the nature that we have on this planet today is a cultural nature, and that some cultures have been very good at sustaining biodiversity. Uh, and some others have not been so good, uh, but that we can use culture. Culture is something, one of our superpowers, that we can do things differently. We can learn uh, through our cultures. And we can sustain and restore biodiversity at levels that are far beyond uh, what has historically happened within the uh, industrial world, at least. So, okay, I'm going to give some apologies to all of those who saw my Martin School lecture. I'm very curious. Like, how many of you saw my Martin School lecture? Oh, Jesus. Yikes, you guys must have had to go for a class or something. Okay, uh, so be warned. There's a section, there's a fair amount of this talk that is connected to the talk I gave before because it's about how I think about the relationships between people and planet. And of course, I mean, you've seen this image a million times, including when I, time I showed it to you, right? Uh, how many times can you show it? Why would you keep showing it? I took it out and I put it back in. And the reason is very simple. This is one of, I think, the best illustrations of the state of the planet in the human age. Okay, the planet now glows at night. Nobody tried to make the planet glow at night, but this is a planet that now actually emits light at night. You can see this with a telescope far away. 
Okay, so this is clearly something that is a physical phenomenon in one sense, and that you can observe it through a telescope from far away. On the other hand, can you understand this using physics? Can you understand it using chemistry? Can you understand it using biology? Okay, there's so many people on Earth that because there's so many people, the Earth lights up at night, right? No, right? It doesn't matter how many people there are. This is the product of material infrastructure built through cultural inheritance is the learning how to do this that took place across generations. And just as simple as that, okay, just like nobody was trying to make the earth glow at night, can people just turn it off? I mean, you can turn off the garage light or some other outdoor light. Yes, you can do that. Can you turn off the planet's lighting? No. So we are creating these changes in the planet, observable from space, observable from far away, transformational changes in the planet. We are responsible Yet somehow we don't have the agency to simply change these things. There's no cockpit on planet Earth. There's no knobs you can turn on the planet, okay? Anything we do to change the planet intentionally is gonna require forms of cooperation that we don't have right now. So that's our situation in the Anthropocene. It's pretty important to think you know, seriously about our real situation. That's our real situation. There's a lot of things going on right now that human societies don't intend to do that are really serious challenges for the future, right? Now, I think it's very important when people put out messages like the sixth mass extinction to qualify this carefully based on the scientific evidence, it would take centuries to actually cause a mass extinction. So we are nowhere near in the sixth mass extinction. We can stop this. We have centuries to do it. Not to say that we shouldn't be dealing with this as an urgent problem, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is we have the power not to be in the sixth mass extinction. That should be the message, not just that we are already in it. Um, but it, nevertheless, land use is probably the most transformative thing that human societies have ever done to the planet. It's easy to think of climate change caused by emissions of carbon from fossil fuels as being the most transformative thing. It's becoming the most transformative thing. But to date, the really big transformation of the planet is land use. Land use has transformed the planet. It's also considered a crisis by many, right? It's something that is causing a lot of challenges that need to be addressed. It is causing massive losses of biodiversity. Something that needs to be addressed, that's a, that's a crisis. But there's a much deeper history here. If you wanna understand land use, the idea that it somehow represents this very recent deforestation of Amazonia, it's incorrect. And if you look a little deeper, look under that deforested landscape, you're gonna find in many places, maybe most places, some evidence of people being there before. This is not a building foundation. This is a, a symbolic geoglyph or cultural product. The idea that extinctions caused by human societies is something that only industrial societies are capable of is not true, right? There's extinctions that occurred, humans contributed to extinctions even before there were agricultural societies. And if you look at the evidence from the point of view of biodiversity patterns in Amazonia today, you can see the legacies of these earlier agricultural and food producing hunter gatherer societies that transformed their landscapes through various practices. We're gonna talk about those things in, in a bit, but the idea that there isn't this much deeper history isn't correct. Now, you see this kind of thing out here, uh, and this is you know kind of an exciting statement, right? Is Was Amazonia not a pristine, wilderness, as it had been described by, for example, Europeans for a very long period of time, uh, is it was it all a cultural parkland? And I think this kind of either or is a bit silly, right? It's not as simple as that. But the idea that people weren't transforming most of Amazonia in some way over the deep time of thousands of years is very unlikely. Almost certainly there's a human impact, a human transformation. Uh, archaeologists who are the scientists with the greatest expertise in understanding human relationships with the environment, right? Paleoecologists can look at the ecological side, um, but for the most part, archeologists are the ones who specifically study the relationships between people and the nature they interact with. They generally don't work at a global scale. And that's one of the reasons why you don't see a whole lot of global scale or even Amazonia scale work from archeology, span but that's changing. We are seeing new assessments. I was part of this assessment, uh, which are able to detect 
through the, the general knowledge even of archaeology, that there are these much deeper signatures of human transformation of the planet. One thing that is very for sure, though, this is the way you get taught about the patterns of life on Earth, right? The global patterns of the biomes. Even a kindergartner can tell you that there are tropical rainforests in the warm, wet places, and the deserts have different types of life. So these global patterns of life on Earth that are shaped by adaptations to climate. All right, that's one way, and an important way to understand the global patterns of life on Earth. But of course, uh, you look out of any window, you look out of any satellite view, uh, you see there's signatures everywhere that people are transforming ecology, okay? And so the biggest transformative force of all is use of land for agriculture. That is about 40% of Earth's land surface has one kind or another of agriculture, and if you add in the urban areas and the infrastructure, it's easily 40, almost 50% potentially of Earth's surface is directly used by people. But that's not all the transformation, right? The tr that they don't use only land in one area and that all the other areas are undisturbed by people. These things are happening in the same place. It's a landscape scale of transformation. We're also gonna talk about that a little bit later, but that's what this idea of anthropos is intended to get at, is this idea that it's not good enough in the human age to understand the global patterns of life shaped by climate. Obviously, look around you, you will see that the global patterns of life are also shaped by the way human societies are interacting with that nature. And that's mostly what I'm gonna talk about today is what are these kinds of interactions? Why do they exist? How can they change? Uh, how could we potentially change them in a way that might be uh, much more beneficial to the rest of life? We've been very, very good at transforming the planet to be good for us. You may not think so, but in fact, with 8 billion people, it wouldn't even be possible to live on this planet without reshaping it. So it's been very good for us in a sense, but it hasn't been good for the rest of life. So what I'm gonna talk about just very briefly is a global assessment we did using these kind of historical reconstructions, basically models of the past. We call this backcasting. You've heard of forecasting, looking at the future, backcasting the past. Uh, we did this with uh, the most common form of global land use model. These are the things that are used to drive climate models with land use. Um, if you wanna check these out, go to anthrooms.org and, and have a look at your neighborhood. You can press play and you can see what's happened over time. I, one reason I'm not gonna be showing slides of uh, the anthrooms in the UK is it's one of the worst areas I've seen, which is very strange. The data here should be so good. But uh, in fact, in the, in the anthrooms data set or the input data set to anthrooms, it's actually quite poor. Uh, you'll recognize that if you go look at them. Um, but the most important message from looking at the global patterns of populations and land use in the past is that humans have been inhabiting and using most of the terrestrial biosphere for the last 12,000 years. So if you look at this, these colors here, right, you can see this kind of, this kind of cultured uh, landscape. These are low intensity uh, land use patterns. Uh, and those are the wildland patterns. You can see it's about three quarters of the terrestrial biosphere 12,000 years ago is inhabited and used. Now, now lightly used, not used in an industrial sense at all. Uh, but you can't think about the history of the biosphere without thinking about people being there from essentially the beginning since the last ice age. Um, looking at it uh, very recently, only 500 years ago, talking about before the Europeans uh, started transforming uh, the Americas, you can see a pattern. But one thing I just want to highlight here is that this kind of model can look at things like the great dying that occurred as a result of the European colonization, slaving, bringing diseases, all sorts of transformations that led to actually a lot of regrowth of forests. The idea that these places were uninhabited had a lot to do with the fact that they were uninhabited because people had died off from the plagues and this sort of thing. Uh, so it's a, it's, a mis it's a mistaken identity to a large extent. Um, looking at it in 1900, you can see things have transformed a lot. But the really big turning points you see are kind of with the beginning of the industrial age. There's where you're really seeing big transformation, and it's in the Americas largely, uh, but also other, other areas that were colonized. Uh, and there you see the, the current state. So you see things are actually kind of leveling off a little bit in terms of this very quick transformational change. Uh, the, big, the big shifts are more like 100 years ago. Um, just to also re just remind people that land use is also very important to understanding climate change. And the changes in land use are the biggest in the past. Recent changes in land use are actually quite small 
compared to the changes 100 years ago when the, pr the prairies of the United States were plowed up, for example. Uh, those are big changes in the past. And actually, this adds up to a significant change in climate. Um, now, this change is, we're talking about thousands of years of change for 0.7 degrees. We're going to do this amount, right, in the next, what, 25 years? So it's a completely different rate of change. But there is change in the past. So there's a very deep history. There's deep roots to the Anthropocene. It's not just a recent crisis. Much deeper than that. It goes much deeper. And we need to think about it in a much deeper way, okay? Human societies transform ecology. They transform it more than any other species ever has. That's a fact, okay? And this is not gonna end. It's never gonna end. The only question is, what kind of transformations are we going to make? There's not gonna be a, a planet that isn't transformed by people. The only question is how. And so I'm gonna talk about a theory for explaining why human societies gain cap capacities, capabilities to transform the biosphere more than any other species ever has. Uh, this, this concept of sociocultural niche construction, which fancy word, probably uh, a little bit awkward to understand. If you're interested in, in learning more about this, there's a new paper coming out very soon, but this older paper from 2015 is kind of the, the core paper on this. Um, you're taught, many of you are probably biologists. I'm trained as a biologist too. You understand evolution. Evolutionary theory is, is central to understanding biology. Okay, so how does life change? Why does life change over time? Well, there's evolution, right? Genetic inheritances are selected for by the environments organisms live in. And so over time, you see different forms of the biosphere. So the abiotic, abiota there is just the kind of the, the non-biological. So anyway, organisms being shaped by an environment that they can't control. But I think everybody realizes that uh, organisms don't just passively uh, have to deal with environments. They can also engineer the environments they live in. Now, this beaver is doing this uh, in order to reproduce. Uh, but the fact is, is that a lot of species do this. It's possible that every species has some kind of engineering price. Bacteria emit certain chemicals to inhibit the growth of other organisms around them, for example, like antibacterials. So a lot of organisms engage in niche construction, uh, which is basically when an organism changes its environment in a way that affects its reproductive fitness, right? Its ability to reproduce in that environment uh, through some type of behavior that, that changes the environment, that produces what's called an ecological inheritance. So we've talked about genetic inheritance. It's an ecological inheritance. Okay, that produces a much more complicated view of evolution by natural selection because not only are organisms being shaped by the environment, the organism can also shape the environment, right? And then the organism has to adapt to live in a shaped environment, right? So it's beca evolution becomes a two-way street, much more complicated, much more unpredictable, much more open-ended. Okay, so that's one part of the story here is ecological inheritance and niche construction. Um, we also need to understand a uh, culture. And the other word for culture is social learning. Social learning is culture. What you learn socially is, is, is culture. A lot of organisms have culture. There's nothing unique about humans with culture. Uh, okay, this songbird must learn the mating songs it must use to attract a mate, can't reproduce without learning these, must learn these from other individuals in its environment. It can't, it's not born with the ability to do this, it has to learn. Okay, so there's an example of cultural inheritance being essential for reproduction. We also need to understand sociality. Okay, we're not the first social species by far, right? There's tons of social species that construct a social niche where they must live together to survive and reproduce. Okay, that's not unusual at all. And as we'll see in a minute, the only really unusual thing about the human form of sociality, there's a few things, but one of the most fundamental ones is the distinction from all the other socialities that are biological. They are not socially learned, they're genetic. If you wanna know, how many individuals live in a wasp's nest? You just need to know the species and you can get a rough estimate because the number of individuals in a colony of a species of social insect is usually determined by the species. They don't live in all sorts of any possible configuration. They live in a certain size of, of, uh, of nest. Um, so it's a genetic form of sociality. I should also mention all the individuals in a social group in the social insects are highly related highly related. Often only one individual reproduces the entire group. 
Okay, so that's a different form of sociality than what humans have. Humans have ultra sociality. Okay, if I asked you how many human individuals can live in a human society, can you tell me? No, you have to know what the culture of that society is. Some societies are very, relatively small, right? They might have just a few dozens of individuals or a few thousand. Now we have societies that have billions of people in them, okay? So it's a very open-ended thing. Our sociality is cultural. It is socially learned. We have to learn how to live in our societies and it's evolving very quickly as a result of the fact that it's culturally learned. It's not genetic. It's not determined that way. So we see very quick transformation of human societies. The other thing is that our culture, we have such good ability to transmit culture, to socially learn because of languages largely, but of course, new tools like the internet enable culture to move more efficiently, more effectively at greater scales than ever before. But this kind of ability to work with socially learned information means that our culture accumulates. And another way of looking at that is you don't have to reinvent the wheel, right? If you wanna build an airplane, you don't have to invent wheels, they're already invented. Right? You can just build the airplane on top of what you've learned from building a car, for example. So things accumulate. If we put these ideas together, right? We talked about niche construction, right? Do humans engineer their environment to sustain their societies? Absolutely. Look around you, right? That's that's how we all ate agricultural products today. That's an engineered environment. So we're obviously niche constructors. We do this by ourselves. Each person constructs their no. We are socially constructing our niche. We do it together. It's a very large scale niche we live in, right? Your food may have come from some people from across the planet. The social scales of our niche construction are unprecedented. Okay, do we have to learn how to do this or are we born doing it? Obviously it's cultural. So it's social, socio-cultural niche construction. That is an exceptional, unprecedented capability that is scaling up rapidly and is open-ended. Where's it going? Where are we going with social culture niche construction? It will continue to evolve. It'll evolve new forms, things we've never heard of. Uh, it's not something that is static, but there are some general patterns that we can see. Now, I wanna make very clear when I show this, it looks like a kind of arrow pointing in a direction. Do not think about it this way. Evolutionary patterns are never directional, okay? Things go back and forth and all around, and I'll reemphasize that in a minute. But what I'm trying to say here is that the smallest scale societies with the least intensive forms of niche construction that use the least amounts of energy in constructing their niche tend to occur first. And then over time, these larger scale societies that are more and more efficient in terms of total land area in constructing their niche and feeding people occur later. And that more energy is used by the larger scale societies that occur later. All right, so let's let's look a little, unpack this a little more. Obviously the social scale thing is, is pretty obvious, uh, but with land use intensity, that's something that's often a little bit striking to some people. Uh, the idea that, well, hunter gatherers use a lot more land per person than you do, right? But that's a fact, okay? The amount of total amount of land that it requires to sustain an individual in an industrial society is actually very low. Now, of course, there's a lot more people in an industrial society, many orders of magnitude people more. So that's why there's more transformation. But per person, land use efficiency, this niche construction intensity is increasing over time. It's getting more efficient. Um, and then energy use, of course, uh, we're very familiar with what's happening with the fossil fuel energy use, but energy use beyond human metabolic energy also is very old, right? The use of fire to cook food is transformative capability. It enables you to not use the biological energy that it normally takes to digest food. You don't have to do that. You can use fire to do that. Some, some archeologists and anthropologists say that was what enabled us to have a large brain is that it takes so much energy to do that and fire made that energy available. Regardless, it's the first step on the trail of scaling up energy use from the biosphere, right? You're using biomass, whether you're using animal traction or burning wood or whatever, you're using biological energy. We discovered, ah, there's a lot of biological energy, millions of years of biological energy available to us in the form of fossilized biomass, okay? That led to the problems we're in right now. But we're also discovering that we have the capability to use energy directly from the abiotic environment. We don't just have to use other species. We can use the sun directly. 
Okay, that's a transformative capability. Think of what happened to the planet when photosynthesis began. Now we can do that. We can bring energy directly from the sun into our society. Nuclear energy, other forms of energy that are beyond the biosphere. Who knows where this is going? But the potential to scale up the interactions with the biosphere are really uh, pretty open-ended. We just don't know where it could go. Now, again, I wanna just come back to this fact. It's easy to think about things are going in this kind of direction. That is not the case, okay? Hunter-gatherer societies, many of them are just as sustainable as they ever were. They have a longer history than industrial societies. They'll probably be there after industrial societies are there, okay? So there's nothing like backward or primitive about earlier forms that have evolved. The cockroach is a good example. We'll be here after us. The horseshoe crab, okay? These are highly evolved, advanced species, uh, but they evolve early, okay? So don't think about... Uh, this is having a directionality or a sign of progress. It's a, it's a diversification. More possibilities are occurring over time. Okay, so what does this add up to in terms of thinking about the Anthropocene and this idea of culture is nature? Very simply, uh, cultural changes change the relationship, change socio-cultural niche construction, right? That's where the dynamics are in the relationship. We learn to do things differently, and that transforms the planet. That's where we are right now. We have an entanglement of human societies with the rest of the biosphere that is changing because our cultures are changing. So one thing we're going to talk about, I'll talk about now some of the changes of the past, but then we're going to talk about what can we do to change things in the future, potentially in a much better direction, not just for us, but thinking about the fact that if we don't do something differently, there's not going to be a whole lot of species left but us. Okay, so we talked about this efficiency of niche construction, and it's very common uh, to, to, to associate the idea of intensification with agriculture and the, and, and the industrial forms of agriculture. But this is not the case, actually. Intensification is something that begins early. Archaeologists study this all the time. Uh, and the first form is often called a niche broadening or dietary broadening, where societies learn to use more species. In some cases, this is driven by something that we talked about before. If you are the woolly mammoth people, and then there's no more woolly mammoths, you got to branch out. And people do. And they figure out how to use more and more species. And you can get more people living on the same land if you can use more species. So it's an early form of intensification. But it gets much more intensive when you can burn the landscape. That sounds like destruction, but in fact, it unleashes the powers of succession. Those plants growing back, much more productive than an old growth forest, for example. And that's where the wildlife want to go to. Good for hunting, good for foraging. This is a practice that's common for hunter-gatherers, is burning the landscape. Uh, there's a lot of practices that hunter-gatherers use on the road to agriculture. Not like everyone's following the road to agriculture, but it puts societies on the road to agriculture. Um, land use intensification with agriculture uh, is well understood, right? And this happens as the demand for the products of the land increases. That's when people use the more intensive technologies. All right, it doesn't seem to make sense to a lot of people. They're kind of more familiar with the Malthusian model is that the demand goes up and the system stays the same and you're stuck with that. And of course that's bad news. But in fact, nobody has any incentive to do any more work than they have to. And so people don't adopt intensive agriculture unless they have to. These techniques usually exist centuries to thousands of years before they become common. And that is the intensification process. It's demand that drives the use of technology. Is solar energy a new thing? No, it's been around since the 1930s in some form. Why is it scaling up and being used right now? There's demand. It's the demand makes this thing roll out, makes it extensive. And that's what's happened with land use as well, these technologies to intensify the use of land. They become common when they're in demand. Okay, why do we see the larger scale societies also tend to be more dense and urban, urbanized, where you have these concentrated populations that are sustained by the rest of the planet. Uh, well, there's a lot of advantages to living in the city. Uh, I'll have another slide I often show that shows that this is true for even in small settlements. There's a lot of advantages to moving into the densest places. Social interactions, the opportunities are greater there in the city. And so people have been moving into the city. Cities are scaling up this is probably the most transformative force on the planet today is urbanization, okay? And it doesn't necessarily have to look beautiful to be changing the world. 
Uh, this is just an example of really rapid urbanization in China. But obviously, it's one of the biggest changes ever. We just passed 50%. It's easy to live in a place like the UK, where it's been urban for quite some time, for the most part. Uh, but in many parts of the world, like China, it's only very recently that most of the population has been urban. Okay, And so urbanization, whatever, it's 2% of the Earth's services, cities. How big a deal is that? Well, it's a huge deal because the relationships between urban societies and the rest of the planet is completely different than it is with small scale uh, societies where agriculture is the practice of the people who use the food. Okay, When you have very dense urban populations, wealthy, you may not think of yourself as wealthy, but you are among the wealthiest people in the world if you live in a city, even in, a, in the third world often. You're wealthier than the people in the countryside, okay? The demands of people in the city have always been met by large-scale specialized producers. The idea that most of the food just comes from any random farmer is not true. There are specialists who provide most of the surplus. Subsistence farming has never fed the city, okay? So it transforms the rest of the planet. It changes the game. Now, on one level, this has been thought of by many as kind of a, a bad thing, the intensification of agriculture, but it also has some aspects that cannot be ignored that are definitely positive. People in the city don't have large families for a variety of reasons, not a simple equation, but it's a fact, okay? And that's a large part of the difference that's happening with population growth over time. Population growth is crashing. We are past peak baby, okay? The birth rates are never going to go back up to those levels, uh, at least within your lifetime, most likely. Uh, okay, and so we're seeing human populations level off. That's largely because of urbanization. It's a huge part of the effect there. Um, the other interesting fact, though, is that if we look at land use, total land use in the purple curve there, uh, it's more or less leveled off. Now, Total agricultural land use is a mix of very low intensity agriculture and very high intensity agriculture. And that proportion is shifting toward high intensity. Okay, so that is changing. Where is the agriculture occurring? Is it mostly in the UK and the United States? No, it's moving around. So the agriculture production is moving around. But the fascinating thing is at this time when we have billions more people, billions of more people over time, the total amount of ag land is pretty much constant. And it's not expected to increase at, at a total level over time. It's really true. Um, the other thing that's fascinating about it is during the same time, you might say, okay, the, no more agriculture then, so people must be starving. Much less starvation now, okay? And that's partly, not completely, but partly caused by the fact that agriculture has become much more intensive. The amount of food produced by the same land has gone way, way, way up. And if you look at that line there, the food supply, that's calories per person. So even while you're adding billions of people to the planet, the number of calories per person is still going up without changing the amount of land. Okay, that's kind of a miracle. That doesn't seem obvious that that should happen. But that is what is happening because of urbanization and land use intensification. And that's made possible what you actually see. And I studied this across China uh, that I saw the regrowth of forests all over the place uh, in populations and city, in, in, in a lot of these villages uh, some of them had become depopulated, but a lot of them had grown a lot uh, over the years. The bottom line is rural China is full of abandoned agriculture with forest growing up and this sort of thing. Now, as I said, right, agriculture is moving around. That's part of the effect that we are seeing. It's not just all a reduction of land. But the reality is, is a lot of land is becoming a place where nature is recovering. And I see that all over the place in the United States, right, in the East Coast. It's just full of forest. The forests around here, there's many more forests around here, I would guess, than there used to be a long time ago. Though I can't be sure about that. That's not my, my specialty around here. Um, bottom line is, here we are living in the most powerful, wealthy, capable, long-lived, best educated, most interconnected, most interdependent. We depend on each other across the planet now. Right, That didn't used to be true. People used to depend on their local neighborhood. We depend on people across the planet right now. That's the planet that we live on. This is the most capable human societies that have ever existed on Earth. Anyone who thinks that we are in a time when humans are not capable of producing a better future are not looking at reality. We are absolutely capable of producing a better future. Will we produce a better future? 
That is the question. That is the question. Will we demand this better future? And another question that's probably the biggest question, is there a we? I just said we many times, right? There's no we on this planet. Just like there's no cockpit on the planet where you can just control things. There's not one way of looking at a better future. Everyone here in this room, and we're pretty similar compared to like a random selection of people on the planet, have different ideas, different ways of thinking about what a better future even means. It means something different to almost everyone. Okay, so that's a real challenge. How do we actually achieve something that we together could produce? That is the really big challenge. There's lots of things to think about. So what, what would a better future even look like? And for some people, the idea of a better future for nature, for example, is an area that is conserved just for nature. And this is an example. This is Yosemite Valley in the United States. I don't know how many of you know this, but there's another valley right next door called Hetcha Hetchy. It's now a reservoir for the city of San Francisco. John Muir, who was the big impetus for conserving this area, tried to conserve Hetcha Hetchy too, he failed. So this is a land use decision. And let's not forget the people that were systematically moved out of this park when it was created. There were indigenous people here too. So there's a lot of issues coming around about how to do conservation of nature. But the bottom line is, it's something that people do. We are doing this, people are conserving nature through different practices. And conservation in protected areas, something has a long history, uh, at least a century or two. Uh, a lot of it's a colonial history, just like Yosemite, with people getting moved out of the land that is conserved. But the bottom line is that's one thing that can be done. So this is an action. The idea that this is just nature doing something. No, this is people. This is societies prioritizing something, prioritizing conservation. There's even this example of a supercomputer optimized how to distribute the conservation areas and how to connect them all together so species can move as climate changes. Perfect, right? The problem is solved. We have an optimal plan. Now you just need to bring the map to the communities and tell them, okay, your house has to move over here because you know the plan isn't here. All right, clearly this is not how the, the planet is gonna change. There's never gonna be the cockpit. The supercomputer optimization is not the challenge here. The challenge here is very different. The challenge here is not about the tech. It's not about the optimization, the computing, the science. That's really not the challenge here. The challenge is cooperation. The challenge is how we work together in the landscapes on the planet that we actually have is a human planet. It's not a place where you just get to turn the knobs and the lights go off, okay? You have to cooperate. It all has to happen when we work together. Um, and the biosphere we have is pretty transformed, okay? About 40% of the terrestrial biosphere is now directly in use. You take that use out, somebody is going to lose something. Okay, so there's a lot of investment in that. Only about 20% of the surface of land is actually in a category that you could call uh, wild without evidence of human populations or land use. And even those areas are probably overestimated, probably less than that. It's a very small area that you could conserve that isn't already spoken for by people. What's this cultured stuff though? All right, there's another 40% sitting there right in the middle. What is that? That is the land that is not intensively used, that is embedded in the used landscapes, okay? It's all around you here, right? That's cultured. We're using this category cultured to describe land that is shaped by human societies, but not necessarily intensively used, okay? It could be hunting. It could be species invasion, could be pollution, could be regrowth after previous use. The bottom line is it is not the same as some forest sitting apart from human societies. This is the nature within the human world, okay? It's twice as much area as outside, okay? Twice as much. It's a much bigger opportunity. This is the opportunity for conservation on this planet, the cultured landscapes of the world. And how do you conserve cultured landscapes? Cooperation. People work together. People agree to do this. If they don't agree, it doesn't work. It doesn't work when you say, okay, we're not going to have hunting here and nobody else agrees to this. You'll still have hunting. All right. That happens all over the place. And just setting up a ranger system to keep people out doesn't work. It just doesn't work. So it's all about working together in a shared landscape. It's about sharing the planet. That's the really big opportunity, not 
the sparing, not these other places. You have to do more than one thing in the landscape. You have to have the human world has to get what it needs. It's not going to live without using some land. And the conservation opportunity is in these used landscapes. Okay. Now, when you see this idea of, oh, you do multifunctionality, you can do conservation and land use in the same place. That's great. No problem, right? Well, actually, of course, conflict is an obvious problem that you get when you have wildlife living right in the human world, uh, as we do, right? And so the good thing is, is that we have learned and are continuing to learn and are going to be learning faster and faster as our priorities change to figure out ways to actually share the landscape with the rest of life. One simple thing is simply allowing uh, or creating space where other species can move within the human infrastructure. And when you do something like build highways, a highway is a specification. How wide is it supposed to be? How tall are the bridges? All these things are rules and regulations. All you need to do is change the regulation so you have to include the ability for other species to move. And it has to be like this and it has to be like that. And after a while, this is just the way the human world operates. It operates a lot according to these kinds of standards. And that is a game-changing thing. And we have to do this at even larger scales, right? Species are going to have to move as the climate of this planet changes. And that is going on very rapidly. And it is something that people are starting to think about. Maybe you've heard of Yellowstone to Yukon as one example of a corridor project uh, at scale. And it actually turned out to be successful, not because it was a really cool idea, although that was part of it, not because there was a ton of money and they got this one central organization to just do this thing. It was actually because the idea got people at the different parks along the way to cooperate together to connect. And it was actually park to park that really made this work, not the whole system. But it is very successful and it's created a lot of mobility. So sharing Earth, sharing the planet is the new priority. And it requires this idea that we're not just thinking about the protected areas as some kind of separate thing, but it has a lot to do with what we're doing within the human world, within these shared landscapes, including the landscapes that are very intensively used. All right, so these, these things matter. And just if you're interested in some of these really uh, very ambitious ideas like half earth, can we conserve 50% of say earth's land for the rest of nature? What would it take to do that? And in this case, uh, we're just running an assessment to look at if you try to get half of the land in each ecoregion in the world, all right, and you have to have large protected areas, not just whatever you can find, you cannot do it. It is not possible to conserve half of the planet if you have to have large protected areas. If you can conserve those landscapes, these shared landscapes where you have smaller patches together, you can have half. It's possible. So just the possibility of doing this requires a thinking about sharing the landscape. That's fundamental. And there's new ideas coming out, new ideas about regulations. It could become true. This idea is relatively new that when you have a industrial scale agricultural landscape, it needs to have some standards. And some of these standards can be some amount of that landscape has to be habitat for other species. So this is just one example of that. Here's another example that's actually operational in the United States not everywhere, but these are some of the most intensively used landscapes on earth. And this, every little square meter of this land can produce a lot of food. It's amazingly productive land, but this idea of introducing strips of prairie vegetation back into Iowa and other intensively used landscapes is catching on. And there's even the ways to use the, con the conservation reserve program, which is a government subsidy program to kind of back this up is happening. So there are new ways to use and share these landscapes. Here's another example from California that I find particularly inspiring is where uh, the conservation organizations and the farmers work together to solve a problem. The farmers were burning rice straw in the winter because you cannot till it in. You have to burn it in order to, to turn it over. Uh, they were getting fined for air pollution in California. It was a big problem for them. Um, there was not enough water bird habitat along the way. Um, Water is very expensive in California. So the wildlife organization stepped in to pay for water to irrigate in the winter, rots the rice straw so they can till it in and provides great habitat for birds. So sharing the landscape in terms of time is also a practice. There could be a time of year where the buffalo could actually roam, maybe in the winter. 
and then roam back. There's all sorts of possibilities for using shared landscapes. Now, let's not forget that there's a lot of landscapes in the world that are not in industrial agriculture, that are still shaped by people. And this is where some of the most biodiverse areas remain on Earth, the indigenous landscapes of the planet. Um, and one thing we showed with our effort to look at the deeper history of land use is that actually most of these landscapes look like the rest of the planet. When you talk about protected areas and you say, oh, well, these areas are really different than the rest of the landscape, but actually not in this slide, but these kind of monikers about this area is natural and that sort of thing. If you really look at their history, you find most of these landscapes are actually uh, in a used history. And when we looked at the patterns of anthromes across the planet at different times and compared them with the planets uh, with different global patterns of, in this case, vertebrate species richness, we found that the statistical association was very high with these patterns between the, the patterns of diversity and the patterns of anthromes, but only about 500 years ago, not today. So maybe something happened 500 years ago. I don't know what. Cultural diversity sustains biodiversity. Okay, why are some of the most biodiverse places left on Earth, like this place? It's easy to look down from space and just see trees, but if you go to the ground, you're not going to just see trees. You're going to see people. People live all over Amazonia, not everywhere in the same density, of course, but the practices of indigenous people are not just destroying biodiversity. That is simply not the case. They are sustainers. They are protectors. We just heard that we are guardians, right? That's going to be a movie you'll see next week, right? Why is there so much biodiversity in the Amazonia? Well, part of it is the people there, their practices, their cultures, and their protection of their spaces have sustained biodiversity. They also manage the landscape in a way that creates different types of habitats. It's not all just one big forest. It's different types of regrowth, lots of different places for different species to live. And there are new technologies, new capabilities being introduced even by the industrial world that are helping to enable some indigenous people to more carefully monitor their territories. And let's not forget, all right, hunter-gatherer societies, you go to a hunter-gatherer society anywhere, they're gonna have steel tools, right? Why do they have steel tools? Because steel tools are great. They work much better than stone tools. And all the societies of the world will use what works, okay? And they will use cell phones and satellites if it protects their territory. And it won't be a problem. I mean, it's the way societies are. They evolve over time. If you want to go see the big five, you want to go see the most amazing megafauna still left on Earth, you don't go to a place without people. You go to the Maasai Mara. And the Maasai Mara is a place that is traditionally the home of the Maasai. The Maasai are not hunter-gatherers. The Maasai are pastoralists. And to be a Maasai of standing, you cannot eat wildlife. Eating wildlife is debasing in their culture. You should eat milk and meat from your own herd, ideally. Uh, and that's what makes you an important person of standing. Their culture sustains the wildlife because they do not consume the wildlife. Another example of these kinds of indigenous cultures that sustain biodiversity, the Martu in Australia systematically burn their landscape. Uh, they burn to, to enhance the productivity of different areas and also to improve the habitat for different species that they, that you use. And without them, what happens when you stop burning the landscape in Australia and you just let the fires be suppressed for generation after generation? What could go wrong? I don't, I don't even need to say anything about this, right? Mega fires is the answer to that. So the idea that you're gonna have this future of conserving biodiversity intact without people, this kind of idea, it doesn't fly. The reality is the most biodiverse places on earth have people living in them and it's their cultures, how they live in these places, how you live in a place will determine what's nature is there. It's not what nature does, it's what you do. That is the future of nature. This can be come back, okay? Indigenous people have been run off the land all over the world. It's an old story. Here in UK, maybe a little different story, but all over the place, the United States certainly is the story. And people are starting to get their rights back. And when their rights come back, they're able to improve the ecology of these places by bringing back some of these traditional cultural practices that manage the landscape to keep the super fires from happening. And more importantly, to, to improve the wildlife for their own purposes, for the most part. Um, 
There's lots of different kinds of landscapes that can improve biodiversity, okay? Coffee landscapes, depends on the kind of landscape. Anyone who knows about coffee, right? There's shade coffee, there's sun coffee, there's industrial coffee, there's small scale artisanal coffee, uh, but there are landscapes that can have coffee and can have high biodiversity, all right? And depending on how things are done, it's possible to actually have industrial supply chains that are not as destructive as they might be. Uh, anyone who thinks that palm oil is just bad, Think about this, how much palm oil can you produce in one acre of tropical land compared to how much soybean oil you can produce in one acre of tropical land? Actually, it's a factor of at least three or four times more oil coming from palm than from soy in the same amount of land. These are the kind of trade-offs and discussions that people need to have about the future of these supply chains. Uh, none of this stuff is working perfectly. Don't expect everything to work perfectly, but the idea that we can't make a difference by reshaping the way we interact with the rest of the planet, don't think that because it's happened and it's already happening. Here's an example from, from China. But the bottom line is in the Anthropocene, uh, the cultures of nature are what sustain biodiversity and they're changing, they're not constant. Um, so I tell this story about in the early 90s, I lived in Beijing, a very, very gray city and China was still poor. China was a poor place. Your working person was really very poor by the standards of the rest of the world. So um, living in this apartment, it's very gray. And finally, the springtime comes and I go out and sit in the park uh, and it's greening up and I'm feeling a little better. And then I hear the birds singing in the trees and I feel a little bit better still. And then I turn around and all the birds are in these cages. And that was kind of a little bit devastating, right? There were no birds in the other trees. It was just the birds in the cages. Uh, and that was about as good as it got in 1990, right? The aspirations for the kind of nature interactions you were going to have, that was about as good as it gets, okay? But things have not stayed the same in China. I think you all know, right? China has changed completely in the last 30 years. Uh, and one of the things that's really changed is that people don't want to just have this kind of very distant relationship with nature. Uh, and when it comes to something like uh, the wildlife that represent China, uh, people want a wild panda. They don't want some domesticated panda somewhere. They like the idea of there's wild pandas in China and people have, are willing to do what it takes to have wild pandas. And it's not necessarily easy when there's very small populations. You have to basically breed pandas to be wild. And how do you do that? You wear a panda suit covered in urine like this guy uh, and that enables you to release the panda and it's not attracted to people. So people are willing to do what it takes uh, is that just a story about pandas? No, it's a story about the relationship between the Chinese society and nature. There are now a huge number more protected. The area of protected areas in China has completely changed. The priorities of China's government have completely changed. The people have changed, all right? It's a transformation in the relationship with nature. This is not just going on in China. This is going on globally. There's greater and greater interest, greater and greater attention being paid to the idea that rather than just be settling for whatever happens, we should guide the planet to a better future for nature. That aspiration for nature is changing the planet. Maybe not fast enough for our taste, but it is changing. Uh, and this is an example, and I think it's important to look at this kind of white area over there. Uh, there's no wolves in the UK yet, as far as I know, but this is because of you. If you want the wolf, it is available to you now okay it's the culture of nature that will determine whether you have wolves that's fundamental because the wolves will come back they have come back they are coming back so if you want to live with wolves if you want wild nature it's available to you it's about your culture though what is considered the norm what is acceptable what is good for you you have to decide um just so you know too it's amazing what can happen when there's a charismatic species involved this is one of a handful of mountain lions that lives inside the city of Los Angeles. You can imagine traipsing around in the backyards, going across the highways, very dangerous. Uh, they're actually spending millions of dollars to build a highway overpass for a handful of lions in this place, okay? Millions of dollars just for a few lions. Okay, this is because of this relationship between us and the rest of nature. And let's not forget, we are nature. This idea that you're 100% human is just an idea. It's not correct. You're about 90% human, right? You're about 10 to 15, maybe even 20%. Your microbes, 
the other species that live on you and in you, and we share them. We share them together. We're sharing them right now, okay? We are not separate from the biosphere. We are connected completely. And this idea that we live on a planet where the balance of nature, the equilibrium of our planet has been disturbed by humanity, just kind of showing up or something like that. It's completely not the right story. It's not correct. Our cultures of nature have shaped the planet for thousands of years. That is the nature that we have. That is the nature that we will have is what our culture produces. If you guys produce a culture that wants wolves, you will have wolves. That is what the future brings. We are entangled together. Nature is cultural. Nature is shaped by culture. Nature needs people. You are going to determine nature. And then finally, the idea that people are only going to destroy nature is just simply not correct. Human societies can sustain biodiversity. They have, they do, they can do better. Thank you. Thank you, Al. So we can open up to questions. Uh, thank you so much for the talk. Um, well, uh, I found very interesting your view on China here. <laughs> oh, sorry. Yes. <laughs> Look, yes. Yeah. Uh, so I'm from Bolivia, and right now uh, we're having a lot of fires, who each year is are becoming more and more serious, and it's because mainly to convert all these forests to soy fields to um, feed the cattle. And this is because now the government in Bolivia are trying to grow economically. They, and they, they're basing that on the exportations of meat to China. So I found very interesting. And um, what are your thoughts that maybe now China is saying, yeah, we're a better country. We have reduced our impact on our like country nature. But there also, since you say now China is growing economically too, so now people have like this level of status that can they can access now to like meat, which before would be like very expensive too. But it's now like on expenses to countries like Bolivia, which now um, like it's really like uh, people are literally right now living with smoke and people are dying like uh, wildlife is getting each each day a lot of photos we get like wildlife is dying and it's because of all these um markets that may like improve other countries and since you say like it all depends on demand so i don't know what are your thoughts on this thank you yeah that's and and so you're talking about basically the commercial demands of china are transforming the planet there's no question that they are right uh, and and Chinese, for example, meat consumption has gone through. I talked to a lot of old people they, that even the richest people in a village could eat meat once a year. Most people never. Um, and, and that's completely changed, completely changed. And in fact, it's one of the reasons why rice is not a limiting factor. Everyone was worried there wasn't going to be enough rice in the world to feed Chinese people. But in fact, uh, Chinese people don't eat so much rice anymore because they're eating so much other things. And that is affecting the planet. Right. Um, but I have to ask this question. So, yes. The market demands for soy, and who knows where that soy is going actually, but a lot of it is going to China for sure. Uh, that's a demand, but it is met in the country. And the question is, what can the country do? Uh, I don't know what the governance system is that is allowing this kind of transformation, uh, whether it's a popular government that everyone's like, Let's make money on soy so we can develop, although that's a, not necessarily the most uh, dramatic way to develop. Soy production probably isn't the, the driver of an economy. But, but you know, governments don't have to allow this. Um, it might be very difficult. The government's weak. There's a great deal of money involved, this sort of thing. But it can't be as simple as just, OK, we can't do anything in the face of demand. You know, economic demand is one force, but another force is governance. And if, if governance can operate effectively and people don't want to have their lands transformed for soy production, it could it could stop. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, right now there are a lot of movement and like people are going to the ministers to demand 
government to take action on this. And this is not only this year, there's going to be past few years and it's repeating. And, you know, like Bolivia, the government is highly corrupted. So I was wondering, like, uh, what, like, um, China could have some sort of, okay, we can, uh, I, I'm not just like, how can they set some sort of like certification of me? So like Bolivia, since it's like the. So again, this is going to be an aspirational demand about the relationship with nature. If this, if the, if the Chinese market has a huge amount of demand for sustainably produced soy or whatever, then you're going to start to see a difference. Um, and that probably is something that's happening, but not probably fast enough. And it's probably, you know, maybe can't be the whole solution. But uh, you do see this with aspirations increasing as people get wealthier. They often, just like here, right, they'll go to the, the market and buy organic food instead of buying the other stuff. But it's hard when people are coming out of poverty. Hi. Um, thank you very much for that talk. Um, last year, I had the ability to hear Mark Williams' uh, exceptional lecture, one of your colleagues on the Anthropocene Working Group. Um, and he gave, I would say, a much more pessimistic uh, account of the present and the future. And I, I listened very carefully to the end of your talk. You hesitated a bit in your third point when you said can, and I almost thought you wanted to say will. But I think as we all would agree, that would be a difficult statement to make. Um, and I'm just, so the question I have is, do you think it it matters, um, and I maybe we can have a conversation later about the inner workings of the Anthropocene Working Group, and uh, it's interesting, but do you think it matters what the disciplinary background is? So for a paleontologist whose time frames are larger, whose, whose, whose sense of markers are maybe different than a biologist, do you think that that explains the difference between your much more optimistic, I would say, um, account of, of alternative futures and what Mark Williams uh, was talking about. Thank you. All right, there's two parts to that that I, I would like to respond to. One is uh, this thing about optimism, all right? I think anyone who thinks that things can't change is just a pessimist. Uh, and, and the idea that things aren't going to be different, they are going to be different. How they're gonna be different is relatively unknown. I don't think we know the future very well. People who say that the future is just gonna be worse, unrealistic, things have gotten better in a lot of ways. It's not as simple as just things get worse. So just card carrying pessimism is un not realistic. It's not that simple. Uh, whether it has to do with disciplinarity, uh, no. Okay, so I have friends who are paleoecologists and I don't know about how many geologists I would say are optimistic <laughs> in a sense, but I, I actually kind of reject the term optimism. I see it as a form of pragmatism. If you want to have a better future, you have to believe it is possible. Step one, if you don't believe it's possible to have a better future, are you going to have a better future? I don't, I don't see how that's possible, right? You have to believe in the possibility. Is there a possibility of a better future? Absolutely. And if you don't believe that, you won't put the pressure on the people who are in a position to help deliver this. And you're in a position to help too, but it's, it doesn't come without struggle, right? There's not gonna be a better future if people just wait for it. It has to be created by people, right? And the idea that it's not possible, this idea that you should just give up is the same thing, right? Because better future is not possible, you should give up. But a better future is possible. It's gonna take demand, it's gonna take struggle. It's not going to, things aren't going to all end up peachy. One of the most important principles, I, I have a slide I often show that the best way to solve a problem is with a bigger problem. And the fact is, I think that's normally the way we solve problems. For example, now that we have a climate crisis that is getting more extreme, uh, what's going to stop solar radiation management? It's going to look like a good thing potentially in a few years if things keep going the way they are in 2023. So uh, I'm not trying to be optimistic and say it's all good, don't worry about it. But if you want a better future, if you want to have any possibility of a better future, you have to believe in that possibility first, and then you have to struggle for it. If you don't believe it's possible, you're basically giving up, and you're giving up, and that's going to hurt all of us. So I think it's really important to have a clear vision that a better future is possible. Uh, but do not think it's guaranteed that it will always happen. That's just that 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 would be absurd. And again, a lot of things that we do to change things for the better, change things for the worse too. It's not simple that way either. 
So there's no panaceas here. I took out that slide. I, I usually show that slide. No panaceas for a better future. But the idea that we can't have it is it's absurd. We definitely can. But we may not. Thank you very much. Thank you, Earl. That was a marvelous talk. I was thrilled by it. And I want to raise two questions for you. Our mutual friend, a new faculty member in the school here, David Moreno Mateos, as you know, is working on forest recovery. And he's interested, if he gets funding, to compare forest recovery in Britain and in the Northeastern United States that you mentioned. And I'd love to know a little bit more um, about what's going on. I know we can't do it here in five minutes. But on a point that you made, I believe, from my conversations with David this week, that if you look at Britain from space, there's very little forest today compared to what there was a few hundred years ago. And I'm not sure. I'm just quoting David. Whereas in the Northeastern USA, as you said, it's coming back like a house on fire to borrow a poor image, perhaps. Um, but this whole business of forest recovery and the shared landscapes that you emphasize, I think are really crucial. Um, and I don't know if you want to add anything further on that. But the other question I had regards the point you're making just now. What will give us hope? What will inspire us that there can be better futures than if we just stick with business as usual? and how to influence our organizations and institutions. As you know, another thing that David and I share is a strong involvement in restoration, in ecological restoration, which provides hope to people, but it only is going to work if there's a paradigm shift. And I'm gonna finish by citing Donella Meadows, who in her list of 12 places in which to intervene in a system, the second most important was rules and regulations. And the first most important was paradigm shifts. So what are your thoughts on those things? Sir? Well, I mean, paradigm shift is fundamental. I think the number one paradigm shift that needs to happen is this narrative that gets promoted. I hate to say it, mostly by conservationists and ecologists that people are the problem because that's simply not the case, right? The only real solution is going to come through people. If you want to have forests back in the UK, has nothing to do with forests, has nothing to do with ecology. It has everything to do with what people want. If people want those forests back, this place could be covered by forests. Okay, now that might lead to soybeans in somewhere else, uh, right? Because people have to eat and they're going to demand that, that they eat. And if they replace what's going on here uh, to feed people, it's going to come from somewhere else. So uh, there have to be some ways to negotiate these things that don't just lead to the wealthiest, most powerful people in the world getting what they want and the rest of the world having to deal with it. Although that seems to be the way that's business as usual, more or less. Uh, but but this idea that forests can't come back somehow, I mean, forests will come back. It takes it takes time, but it mostly takes the the, the will and people have the will. Um, and And people's cultures change. You know, the idea that there's this fixed human culture that just destroys nature is completely wrong. It's just not like that. There's all different kinds of human cultures and even a, any culture at any given time can change completely. Um, and they do, they do, and they are. Why are you even talking about restoring forests, right? Wasn't something in the past, a good forest was some timber in your house, you know, right. things change. Um, so obviously there's just in terms of just the amount of sort of subject matter um, that one has to grasp with in order to sort of fully understand how um, um, anthropomes and sort of the relationship, the relationship between the Anthropocene and the biosphere works. It just requires sort of an enormous amount of stuff that you have to understand on like a temporal level. So, you know, at least 12,000 years and also sort of on a on a spatial scale of like the entire planet and also sort of having to understand not only sort of how ecology works but also how like history and culture and 
politics and all of these things sort of come together. Um, so my question is, so, I mean, obviously with this lecture, you've covered a lot of ground, but sort of while you're, when you're working on these topics, how do you not, how do you not either sort of just silo yourself into like sort of an extremely narrow subfield and sort of miss out on this kind of broader picture, but also not sort of take up so much that you kind of just sort of go insane trying to grasp it all? Well, maybe I did go insane. <laughs> you never know. Um, but yeah, I mean, it is like kind of daunting to kind of leap into, you know, culture is a whole field. You know, social change is a whole field that has culture in it and history and other whole, you know, economics. There's a million ways to look at the planet. And so, yeah, it has been very mind expanding, very daunting. Uh, I think number one thing, though, is you have to start with humility and knowing that you're really not going to be an expert in any of these things uh, to get started on, on trying to think about things like this. Um, another thing is, is you're, you're standing on the shoulders of a lot of giants, right? You're reading and you're, you're learning from other people who are more expert in these things and have thought about them more. And you're kind of, you know, just integrating those kinds of things. And I think that's, that's how I've managed to be able to think about these things. And I think that the biggest danger of all, and it happens all the time, uh, I'm guilty of it. In fact, my we in quotes was added. Uh, um, yeah, here's a good example of being humbled in public for good reason, right? The Anthropocene lends itself to this kind of humanity needs to do X narrative. It's a species are changing the planet narrative. That's just wrong, okay? Like the climate is not changing because of our species. The planet is changing because some people are burning fossil fuels. That is the problem. It's not humanity. It's not the species. So you have to kind of take a step back and look, you know, don't turn this into like the Anthropocene is doing this to us. There are people responsible. There are these social processes that are not just humanity. You shouldn't, the totalizing narrative of these things is the biggest danger of thinking like this. You have to, you, you, you really got to be careful about that. Never, always question whether it's the species or humanity. There's not a, there, we are a species, it's true. We are all related, but uh, the societies and cultures are very diverse. And some people are more responsible for than others for certain things. Um, hi, thank, uh, in here in the back. Uh, thank you for that talk. Um, I wanted to ask a question about um, this concept of human aspiration being this catalyst between cultural change and ecological change. And you gave a few examples of um, the ecological functions of people, where you gave examples of, um, say, the Maasai in Africa or um, shade coffee. And one could argue that um, a lot of the people who live in these um, cultures that uh, sort of coexist with nature um, would not rate very highly on today's um, sort of metrics of development or uh, sort of human safety and security in a socioeconomic sense. Um, and one could also argue that it is human aspiration for an improvement in the human condition that has in part led to ecological sort of malfunction today. Uh, so how does human aspiration, how do you shift that human aspiration from one that sort of opposes nature to one that sort of en enables it? Oh, one slide too many. All right, so uh, great question. And uh, it was the subject of my Martin School talk uh, is, is about trying to shape aspirations a little differently. Uh, the, I think you're very right. Like the aspirations of people living in poverty are to get out of poverty. And those are the right aspirations, right? There's nothing good about poverty, right? And that's going to be the first aspiration. Uh, so we're mostly talking about shaping the aspirations of people to have a better relationship with nature after they're able to get out of poverty, right? You could argue that people in a desperate situation uh, living in some of these more difficult places to live, uh, actually have a pretty good relationship with nature uh, in a sense, in that they're certainly not destroying it and they're offering themselves up to nature all the time in a sense, they have no choice. Uh, on the other hand, yeah, they wanna be out of poverty. So I think what we're really talking about here is, is this idea that 
Okay, the goal, the aspiration number one for people is definitely going to be to get out of poverty. Okay, and and, and any anyone who thinks that you're going to keep people in poverty, you know, that's that's the most powerful force of all is to get out of poverty, and that is what shaped the world largely as it is to some degree. The question is, what happens? It, what can we do once we've done this? I mean, obviously, how can we pull everybody out of poverty is the most important question. But then, once we're in this societies that can choose more what they do and business as usual is a different kind of business. Uh, what can we do to shape aspirations that are about reconnecting to some degree? Because it, it, one of the, the, the challenges of talking about this transition is that there's this distancing function that happens uh, with development. As people live in more and more developed societies, they often spend a lot less time outside they often do not interact directly with anything wild or anything even domesticated. They're just in the city, right? You see a little bit of this here and there. Um, and so you don't even know where your soybeans are coming from, your food or anything. Whereas, you know, people in these other societies, they know exactly where their food is coming from. They had to kill it or harvest it or whatever. Um, so, yeah, it's a, it's a kind of, it's not a single journey for everyone. But I think it's really critical to emphasize, and I'm talking here not to the poorest people in the world right now, I'm talking to the richest people in the world, uh, to emphasize that the fundamental need, not just to help everyone out of poverty, although that is fundamental, uh, is also to do better by the rest of the planet. That's the part that we've been doing very poorly with. When I say we, I mean us in the developed world have done very poorly with the rest of the planet. The rest of the planet is suffering because of us, mostly. And so it's on us. To do something better with that. Yeah, yeah I'll, I'll leave it there. So we'll take one, one last one. Or... Um, thanks for the talk, Carl. That was great. Um, I really like the, the many different ways that you present nature as a cultural thing, cultural natures. Um, and I wondered what you think of the idea that on the one hand, concepts of nature have a cultural underpinning and are culturally shaped. But on the other hand, it seems to me that ideas of what culture is, what society is, rely on the ecological world for their coherence. For example, whether or not I want the wolves in the UK, they've got to want me as well. And I remember in Braiding Sweetgrass by Robin Wall Kimmerer, she writes of how humans are seen as kind of the younger brothers and sisters in the family of living beings. And sorry, I had a mind blank. <laughs> well, you're talking about an extended kinship model of relationship with nature, where we're all in a big family, right? That there's no distinction between the, the human people and the wolf people, right, and the right. plant people, sorry, I, I, and the earth people. Yeah, it's all one family. And I think there's one really central thing about this is that we all understand what it means to have a good relationship with your family, and nobody really wants to have a bad relationship with their family, even though you know a lot of people do. But it's not an aspiration. The aspiration is to, to be a person of good standing. You want to have good relationships with other people. And so the idea that, you know, the plant people and the wolf people aren't people too is part of the problem in a sense, right? Having that stronger personal relationship with the rest of nature is pretty fundamental to having a better relationship with the rest of nature. Right. So I, I was just, that. I was thinking about the aspirations of nature. And I think I wouldn't have known what could be aspired to if that hadn't been shown to me by an oak tree or Port Meadow or the different landscapes that I've been to. Or your friends or your dad, or, you know, it's, it's a coach. It's a so, so culture is learned from everybody too. It's, it's not just, you know, it's not just coming from trees. I mean, you can have a relationship with the tree. I, I believe that. And, and a tree could inspire you, but it, you know, it's not just about the trees. You, you live in a society, it's your, your social relationship, the culture around you has a lot to do with whether you'd aspire to have a relationship with a tree. Sure. Thank you.
Okay, let's just uh, wrap up. So lots to think about there. We've got a drinks reception just down the hallway. You're all welcome to come and have a drink and a more informal conversation as well. So do, uh, do, do come along to that. And, and thank you once again. All right. Thank you, Edmunder. Let's all have good relationships with trees, right? <laughs>